right, thank you so much, uh, Jessica, for the introductions and for hosting this series. I've personally benefited a lot from this new seminar series, I mean, not um, seminar, sorry, speaker series that was created uh, last year by Jessica Leno jointly with uh, Grant Miller, the director uh, of the center. So thank you for this great innovation. Um, and to introduce the topic tonight, uh, I just uh, wanted to remind everyone of the definition of philanthropy. As you know from Greek, it's the love of mankind. Um, and an operational definition of philanthropy is um, the desire to improve the welfare of others. Now, welfare policy also has kind of like the same aim, make the lives of others better. So in principle, those two uh, things have you know, very similar aims. And to the extent that we think that a big um, part of welfare is having you know, income, or <laughs> a big part of welfare improvement is reduction in poverty, you would think that a natural thing for both philanthropy and policy to do would be to just give, give cash to people who don't have it. Um, but as you all know, that's not really been at the center of either philanthropy or um, welfare policy for the longest time. And it's only about 20 years ago that cash transfer programs started being put in place uh, by governments, with the Progress Act program uh, being the first one uh, in Mexico. There was a conditional cash transfer program. In the last 20 years, this type of program have kind of like ramped up. Uh, most of them are conditional. Uh, and now we are start starting to hear um, more... Um, uh, discussions of, of making just blanket cash transfers without conditions attached. So to get started, I wanted to ask the speakers to share with us their view of uh, where we stand right now in terms of the lay of the land, um, what is the scope of cash transfer programs by uh, governments around the world, um, what is the, the rationale behind having conditions, and what is the discussion behind the idea of removing these conditions. I don't know who wants to start that we agreed the senior Paul should always start. <laughs> so I should say that, that Paul Niehaus is, is the real speaker here tonight. Um, he actually does something. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> beside, beside, in addition to, to a lot of teaching and wonderful writing. So I want to I wanna maybe turn it back to you, Paul, with, turn Pascaline's question back to you with this question. A, a key aspect of any good philanthropy is knowing what goal you're trying to achieve. And so conditional cash transfer programs are quite clear about the goals because uh, you could, you could, without even knowing what the goal of a program that pays families to get their kids vaccinated, uh, you can figure that out. Uh, it's for the health of the families, but also uh, the external benefits. Uh, that vaccination brings to, to the community through herd immunity. Uh, something that, that has intrigued me about Give Directly from the very beginning, um, and we don't need to segue immediately to Give Directly, but it, it does raise the question of goals, is, is Give Directly designed to alleviate poverty in some, by some measurable outcomes? Or is it designed to allow families that receive the grants to uh, have a choice over how they spend the money, uh, which may or may not alleviate poverty? Uh, so conditional cash transfer, transfer programs are fundamentally, they provide no choice. For those of you who don't know how a conditional cash transfer works, it's simply you get paid by the government, typically. Philanthropy has played some role, but these are mostly, I think, government-supported programs based on evidence that you've sent your kids to school, that you've sent them to be vaccinated. Uh, and so it's, it's giving quite indirectly <laughs> and conditionally. So maybe it'd be helpful to talk about goals. Yeah, sure. So there's a lot of ground to cover. I think uh, just some basic facts about the way the world looks in terms of funding and how uh, all the various funding flows Pascaline mentioned sort of work today. And then also when we started Give Directly, how, what was our, our thinking on this kind of very fundamental question that Paul raised? So um, let me try to cover them both in turn. I don't want to speak for too long because um, it should be very much a discussion. But um, I'll just start with the... the, the oh, got a lot <laughs> I'll start with um, <clears throat> the sort of the lay of the landscape, just in terms of funding flows, um, and elaborate a little bit on a couple of things Paul said, and then get into um, a bit more philosophy. So um, as Pascaline mentioned, cash transfers have become a much bigger part of the way um, we fight poverty internationally. And that's a surprise for a lot of people, because I think for many people, especially in the West, it seems like this crazy 
uh, weird new idea. And that's certainly the experience we had starting GiveDirectly, that I think at, at every step along the way, people told us that we were nuts. Um, we had people, someone who told us that we were smoking crack um, at one point ended up funding us. Um, <laughs> so, um, and uh, even Paul had some tough questions for us at the beginning, so um, rightly so. Um, so, you know, I think we have this perception of this as a very strange, unorthodox thing. Um, it is actually sort of a mainstay of anti-poverty programming in developing countries today. So in Latin America, most countries now have at least one conditional cash transfer program, as Pascaline mentioned. And so that means that people have to do certain things first, and then they're given money that they can do whatever they want with. Um, in Africa, just about every sub-Saharan African country now has at least one unconditional program, which means that people are given money without having to jump through any hoops first. Um, and then a lot of uh, South and South Asian uh, uh, and Southeast Asian countries also have meaningful programs. So globally right now, the sort of median anti-poverty dollar spent by a government in an emerging market um, is actually a cash transfer. It's, not a, it's a transfer of money, not of stuff. Um, it was something I think a lot of people don't realize. Partly that's because the way we in the West, whether it's individually or as uh, governments through foreign aid, um, spend money to try to reduce poverty is very different. So we give very little as cash transfers. Um, if you look at the public sector at foreign aid, um, humanitarian aid, sort of help to refugees, to victims of natural disasters, that's probably been the most cash-friendly sector. Um, and we think that's maybe about 8% or so of humanitarian aid that goes as cash transfers. There's a lot of discussion that it should be higher but not too much movement. Um, and then outside of development, um, very small numbers in sort of a, in, in development aid. Um, when you look at philanthropic giving, Americans give probably about $20 billion a year to international development. Um, and you know, we kind of think it's give directly. We're about 0.5% of that um, that's, that's cash transfers, right? And the rest is gifts of stuff or services, right? Um, so you know, that's kind of very much the kind of the big picture. Um, why did, when we created Give Directly, you know, to Paul's question, right? Where, where did we see kind of cash transfers fitting in, um, and how did we want people to think about them? I think that there are uh, sort of two very different roles that cash transfers can play. Um, to Paul's point, as a philanthropist, you may have a specific objective. Um, you may care about health, right? That may be the thing that drives you. You want to really see improvements in health. Um, I think what we'd say to somebody who's who set that as a specific goal is two things. Um, one is a lot of things that we fund as philanthropists or foreign aid programs turn out to not work as well as we'd like. Right? Um, and hopefully we can talk a bit more about that um, as the evening goes on. Um, but you want some sort of discipline, some rigor to make sure that the things you're funding actually work. And one very basic thing to do is to check and make sure that on that outcome, you told me, I want to improve disability adjusted life years, let's say, you're at least getting as much impact per dollar as you would with a cash transfer. So even if I don't question your values framework, your sort of normative assessment of what you try to achieve, there's this very basic question of let's make sure that we're at least doing that much good. And it's a low bar, right? Because if I give a cash transfer to a household, they're going to spend a lot of that on stuff that's not health, right, on other things. Um, and so you know, from your perspective and your value framework, that's not going to be worth anything. Um, but it's a low bar that you might want your work to pass. Um, but I think the second thing that you get when you start thinking about cash transfers, and especially if you look at the evidence and what people do when you give them money, um, is it forces you to step back a little bit and question your narrow lens and say, you know, does defining success, my success around this one narrow outcome, health, actually make sense when you look in the data and you see there are a lot of other things people care about as well. How should I think about that? And I think that uh, for many people and for many organizations, that's a really healthy challenge. So at a very fundamental level, those are sort of the two roles that we see cash playing. One is as a low bar for cost effectiveness for people who are wedded to a specific framework. But the other is as a, as a sort of healthy disciplinary device to force us on occasion to question those frameworks and ask how well are they aligned with the preferences and the values of the people that I'm fundamentally ultimately trying to help. Thank you. So um, jumping on this issue that it's a low bar to compare the effect of any program targeted at a specific outcome against the effect on that outcome of cash, which can be very diffusely used. Um, it seems like if, if you're going to do um, cash transfers, looking at the extent to which you change um, people's lives is, on one hand, extremely easy. You just give them $10. You can value it as, <laughs> at $10. On the other hand, if you are under um, sustainable, susta what is it, SDG, sustainable, <laughs> sustainable development <laughs> goals um, framework, then you have a like, specific uh, uh, milestone that you're looking to, you know, to achieve, and so, so it seems like um, it's going to be harder to document 
uh, impacts in that, under that framework or in the way people are used to think about it because it's very diffuse. Some households may choose to use their cash for education, some for health, or a little bit for education, a little bit for health, and a little bit for an, you know, an iron roof over the head. And so observing uh, or, or like measuring outcomes is going to be trickier. We are moving towards um, a more demanding um, set of, of donors and philanthropists who would like to see impact. Um, so how do you reconcile those two, uh, those two things? Mm -hmm. Let me just pile on with that question. <laughs> so it's, if, if you think, um, and give well which rates uh, a handful of charities in developing countries thinks this way, and I think everybody hopes this way, if you think that you can reduce almost every social or health outcome to quality adjusted life years. And maybe, Paul, you should explain because maybe not everybody in the audience understands that. You'll do a better job explaining it than I will. But that is if you can reduce housing and health and education and sanitation and other outcomes, and you can have qualities for all of them, then you probably do have a metric uh, for improving welfare in a discernible way, other than the improvement when people just have choices. So the question is, 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 that, is that an assumption that GiveDirectly makes? And how good, is, how good is the measurement, especially across domains? You, I, you also have Pascaline's question to well, begin. One interview and two speakers. <laughs> <laughs> um, these are all really good. Um, so, um, no, there's a, it's funny, I've, I've been working on GiveDirectly for a while. I never actually was involved in any cash transfer research or impact evaluation until recently. And uh, got started on a couple of these projects and realized exactly what Pascaline said, which is, my God, you have to measure everything if you want to give a comprehensive accounting because, you know, you give people money and everything's going to change, right? Um, you know, and I would say, like, if I were to summarize what we've learned so far from uh, the research on cash transfers, there's been a ton of experimental research, and it's been a big part of the story over the last decade. Um, you know, it's been, you know, one, one big lesson which you should know is that we haven't seen impacts on a lot of the, the sort of harmful things that people have been worried about, right? Worried that people are going to spend the money on alcohol, drugs, things like that. Um, if anything, it's been the opposite, I think, in the, in the data. Um, and you haven't seen negative impacts like people stopping work, things like that. Um, but then point two is that you see sort of positive impacts, but on a really wide range of things. Um, and a set of things that varies a lot from context to context and person to person. So, you know, I think the second big takeaway that I take from this is that uh, people are very different, settings are very different, people's priorities and goals vary a lot. Um, and so I do, Paul, you know, I'm cautious to, to attempt to boil all of that down to any one number, um, you know, personally, just in terms of my own ethical framework. Um, our approach as GiveDirectly has been to say, we recognize that different people are going to have different metrics. Some people will want to try to turn all of this into disability-adjusted life years or one of these, these sort of aggregate metrics of well-being. Um, you know, me as Paul, I feel very uncomfortable because I don't think there's any one number that would summarize, you know, how, I, how I'm doing um, on my well-being. But, but we recognize different people are going to have different frameworks. And so our, we see our role as getting high-quality data out there that lets people um, form those assessments by measuring as many of the relevant things as we can um, and then letting people kind of uh, do with it um, as they will. So that's sort of the role that, that we've kind of cast for ourselves. Um, but, you know, so I'd say, look, there's very kind of practical advice if you're kind of getting into research. Cash transfer is probably a horrible thing to work on because, you know, you do need to have massive samples and there are interesting, I think, technical innovations to be made to kind of advance all of that. But I think that the, you know, the kind of the more important and sort of serious side, Pascaline, of your question is that part of the point of doing these studies of cash transfer is kind of demanding as they may be on us as researchers is really to question things like the SDGs, right? Like, is the process of a bunch of powerful people getting together in New York and setting goals really the right way for goal setting to work, right? Or, or should it be more, uh, more, more democratic and should people have more individuality and more say over what their own goals look like, um, which is the, the freedom that cash transfers give them? But so if everybody is free to um, uh, try to achieve their own goal, you may have more difficulty solving coordination problems or, or market size problems. So for example, um, something close to my, uh, my own research, uh, thinking of like distribution of bed nets. One reason why this may be something that is going to have more of an impact than just giving cash to people to buy bed nets is that if only a few people want to buy the bed nets, maybe there's going to be no savings on shipping costs, no bulk discount, the cost will be higher, no market will develop. Whereas if the government 
uh, does it at scale, they can uh, create, uh, they can have the market size and the market power to get to get it done much more cheaply. And likewise, going to the herd immunity point that Paul made earlier, if everybody at the same time protects themselves against the same disease, you can then get to the point where it's eradicated. So there are this, um, this, the, the, all, you know, this, um, this, this coordination issues and this, this uh, market size issue that are going to uh, not be as easily solved when everybody can pursue their own thing. So are there specific domains where you think um, the, the philanthropic and policy world is wrong-headed to be very vertical and issue-oriented and where clearly cash would make more sense and, and somewhere you think uh, indeed it makes sense to have more programmatic uh, approaches? Yeah, sure. So I, I, I think, I mean, so, I, you know, I, 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 as, a, this is, as an economist, this is where I think uh, economics kind of actually really excels and is a very helpful framework. Um, you know, one of the things I learned uh, doing my PhD um, at Stanford, um, <laughs> um, you know, is so, sort of this framework for thinking about when is individual decision making likely to lead to outcomes that are sort of pretty good in the aggregate, and when is it likely to leave a lot of value on the table and sort of miss something important. And so economics sort of gives us a framework that helps us identify, we use words like public goods or externalities, things like this, right? But we have these concepts that help us identify places where that's likely to be true, right? That you could do more, you could do better through some side of coordinated or centralized or top-down intervention. Um, so, you know, infectious disease is a great example of that where kind of steps that I take to prevent getting infected myself are going to benefit you as well. And uh, Pascaline's research, which she refers to and research by other people, sort of basically show, um, looking at, at malaria as an example, um, that, you know, A, if, if I get a bed net, which is going to reduce my risk of malaria, it reduces your risk as well, if you live close to me. Um, and B, that people aren't willing to pay very much for bed nets, maybe partly because they don't value those external benefits to other people in the community, right? Um, and so, you know, that, that kind of commonsensical when you think about it. But um, so I certainly think that, like, there are these helpful intuitions that can guide us as to where, where might those kind of you know, outside social returns be where you do want a subsidy or something you know, top down um, to intervene. Um, you know, what I think you have to have is some sort of discipline in the process of decision making, right? So there are, you know, whole swaths of aid spending right now where we know for a fact that these things don't work very well, right? Um, active labor market policy, I think an area I like to beat up on a little bit, you know, this is sort of interventions that are meant to help people find jobs, right? And, you know, it's something that's sort of like in the billion dollar a year kind of range that, that aid agencies have typically been spending. And across the board, the impact evaluations of these have been pretty disappointing. Um, and, but we still do them, right? And so there has to be some, some, some mechanism, some discipline that we can in, impose to kind of prevent that sort of thing so that the theory of change sounding good, um, you know, isn't, isn't all, all it takes to get something funded. Um, friends of mine, so we're talking to a friend of ours who works at a, one of the big you know, international aid agencies, um, and I won't name who they are, um, told us that of the last 15 impact evaluations they've done, three of them came back with positive results. Um, so, you know, these are like really low hit rates, um, and yet a lot of these programs continue to get funded. And so, you know, we need some sort of disciplinary mechanism. Um, and, and I think that's part of the role that we think cash transfers can play. Paul, you should add. I'd like to make a comment that's sort of orthogonal to this and then, and then ask another difficult question, although Paul doesn't find I have a question for any... you, Paul, at some point. <laughs> my, my Stanford PhD. I'm he right. doesn't find any of the questions difficult. One is one way in which give directly is sort of at the at the beginning of a movement which it's surprising that it has taken this long in philanthropy to develop, which is caring about the views of beneficiaries. For a long time, as long as philanthropy has existed, as long as foundations have existed anyway, there's been always a concern, you know, you don't pay enough attention to the grantee. You know, you're not treating the grantee as a partner. Putting that aside, grantees and philanthropists alike tended very often to impose their views about what what welfare would be on their beneficiaries. And a movement which has really only taken root in the period uh, that Give Directly has existed is beneficiary voice, beneficiary feedback, aided to some extent uh, by developments in human-centered design and the ethnographic work that goes into <laughs> human-centered design. So Give Directly is very much at the lead of that, and that's, that's terrific. And now the question. So, because economists are very used to kind of toy questions where you say, you know, hold something constant. One, one advantage that Give Directly has is that it has very, very low administrative costs. 
And there's nothing wrong with organizations having administrative costs. But in this case, if you can, re if you can achieve the same outcome with, with and without administrative costs, you'd always rather reduce them. Let's suppose that you didn't value, this is the, the you know, supposition part of the question, suppose you didn't value autonomy as a goal, but we're only valuing kind of health, education, and other welfare outcomes. Mm. How would you compare, in general, the effect of conditional cash transfer programs aimed at those outcomes and give directly? Give directly would certainly be better if the net impact is greater because of the low administrative cost. What do you think? Yeah. So, uh, Paul, the let me say um, one thing about the. Uh, let me answer the specific question and then come back to the theme we had before about public goods because I I want to get your thoughts on something. But the so the, your specific question is about CCTs versus UCTs and what do we know about the administrative costs, the added costs of running a CCT and whether they're worth it. Right. Is that right? That's yeah. Much clearer way of putting. It. Yeah. So, um, so it, it, you know, it's an interesting question. I've seen actually relatively little documentation of the costs of CCTs or sort of an attempt to compare what the cost would have been if they had removed those conditions. Um, in some cases, to be honest, it's because these things were intentionally designed to make the conditions sort of unimportant. Um, so part of the political economy of these programs in Latin America has been in case, you know, you know voters often prefer uh, programs where, you know, that aren't just a handout. Where people, you know, kind of have to jump through some hoops to get the money, um, but you know, in some cases, you have these programs that have nominal conditions, but there's no enforcement of them. Or in some cases, there are conditions that 90% of the population already are meeting, so that you know, for 90% of people, it is an inframarginal. So you know, there's kind of a layer of subtlety, I think, beneath that question that um, that makes it a bit tricky to answer. But you know, that having been said, I think that um, there are plenty of cases in which the condition that, that I have seen where the conditions don't seem too costly to administer. Um, what we don't have is the kind of head-to-head -head experiment, right, comparing the two. And so, we, you know, that's something we just don't know. Um, the, the thing I wanted to come back to was to this question. Um, uh, uh, one thing that I've been really interested in, because people often ask, well, give directly is great, but there are these public goods, you know, and these, you know, how would you, how would you address that? Um, do you have any ideas on that? And you mentioned this sort of new perspective of beneficiary feedback. I think a really interesting thing for someone to do, um, you know, those of you who go out and create some successful startup and then want to give your money away, um, would be to build what looks very much like a traditional foundation with silos, right? You know, people, program officers doing health, education, all of that. Uh, but with the one key difference that at the end of the day, the people who decide which things get funded are not the people at the top, but the people at the bottom. And to give those people the option of getting the money as a cash transfer if they want to, right? Because I believe in the role of the program officer, right? I think there is value in having people that are out there looking, you know, scouring the world for great programs, for things that solve externalities, right? Bed nets, um, uh, uh, you know, building roads, whatever it is. But I think it would be really cool if those ideas then had to pass, not the kind of can you convince the principal in San Francisco that this is a good idea test, but that can you convince the people living in this village that it would be better for them to get this program than to just get the cost of the program transferred into their digital wallets, which GiveDirectly could do for you. Um, I think that would be a really neat kind of taking this conversation about kind of feed and accountability and feedback from beneficiaries to the logical limit. You could actually democratize the decision making. I think that would be really neat. But um, not on that, there can also be information failures, right? So by letting people choose what they think is best, you put their priors about the returns to a given intervention yeah. at the very center of that decision to the extent that we ourselves uh, often do not know at all what's the likely effectiveness of something. Yeah. Uh, we should also pick up on the fact that maybe, you know, in as much as I'm facing the trouble myself, I may not know either. Right? Yeah, yeah. So it would be interesting to know who knows better. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and I, I'm I, open to absolutely to the idea that uh, we, we know less. Um, but it seems like everyone is entitled to not know everything, yeah. even uh, the very poor, right? For sure. I mean, look, the modal American donor, I think, still thinks that if you give money to a poor person in Africa, they're going to get drunk, right? And so I've, I've spent, like, most of the last 10 years on that information failure. No, uh, absolutely. Right? <laughs> so, okay, Paul, now it's your time to be uh, on, the, on the tough spot. Um, let's talk a little bit about impact investing, that the other new kid on the block. Um, and it kind of has a bad reputation among, among academics, I, I would say, because of the way impact is measured, uh, not seeming really super serious. 
Uh, am I, I know you're an expert on this topic, so am I being very unfair to impact investing? Or what's, what's your view on, on whether you know, impact investing is a serious form of, of philanthropy? Um, so, at, and I should, Mark Wolfson, who is my co-teacher and co-writer on, on this subject, is here. And I should, I should call on him to correct me. But I'm going to give, so just, just so those of you who are not familiar with impact investing understand what it is, it's investing, typically equity investing, in for-profit companies with the goal of, the philanthropist's goal is to achieve social impact through the impact of those companies. So for example, investing in a, uh, this is an actual investment by a very large private equity company in a dairy in India with the goal of improving the lives of the farmers, of the dairy farmers. Um, and the impact of, in, there, there are concessionary impact investments where you're taking a loss, perhaps in order to prove the concept so that regular investors will come in. But I want to focus on impact, the in, impact investing field as is developing is mainly investments by fund managers who tell their uh, limited partners that they will get good financial returns as well as impact. And there really are two questions in impact. The first one is no different from philanthropy, which is, is that organization actually producing social income impact? Uh, is, it, is it making something happen that otherwise wouldn't happen? Uh, or is it creating jobs for dairy farmers that otherwise wouldn't happen? Just a footnote. Uh, something which I think philanthropy and impact investing doesn't think very much about is possible external costs, like are we creating more methane in the process? But let's, let's, let's put that aside. That aspect of impact investing, that is the impact of the investee, measuring that is not different from measuring the kind of work, Pascaline, that you do. It's not whether bed nets reduce malaria in this visit. The question that impact investing has not answered for the most part is, is your investment actually making something happen that otherwise wouldn't happen? Because it's quite possible, uh, I'm not going to, uh, I'll use the dairy example without knowing much about it, but it's quite possible that that dairy would be fully capitalized at the same cost by ordinary investors who don't care about impact. And what the impact investing field is not, the question they're not asking, which, which Mark and I and a co-author have pushed them to ask, is, is the investment having impact? You can feel very good about an investment. You're investing in a company that does good environmental things, that produces jobs, but there's a difference between feeling good about it, and your values being aligned with the company and actually having impact. And I think that is the place where impact investing is sort of the soft, the soft spot right now, uh, where the answer is no one's, no one's really asking the questions very hard. There, by the way, there, there, there are two fundamental ways to have impact. One is you're providing capital that somebody else wouldn't. And the other is you're providing technical assistance that ordinary investors wouldn't. It would be nice if the investors' investment funds began being transparent about how they're having impact. Yeah, um, I will... Um... I've been getting my toes a little bit wet in impact investing, kind of taking on some advisory work with Paul's guidance. I think um, I, I agree with everything that Paul has said. Um, I think that there is, at a very high level, this is a very, it's still a very exciting thing to me because we're talking about you know vast amounts of money and people for the first time starting to think about whether they it could, the money could be used to achieve good things. Um, and so I think there is potential there. Um, I think uh, Paul's absolutely right that this fundamental question of you know would this investment have happened had I not made it. Um, you know, there are sort of a few camps. There are people who don't even think about it. Um, there are people who have thought about it but deny that it's important. Um, and there are, I think, some people who kind of recognize that it's actually a real question and that they don't have a good answer to it and are interested in making progress on it. And it's a tough one because it's not a question we're going to be answered by running our CTs, right? You can't make and not make the same investment you know, 30 times and see if other people crowd in. You have to have some other way of thinking about that piece of counterfactual reasoning. And in some ways, that's to me what makes it most intellectually exciting, right? Is that that's, that is kind of clearly a hard question for which we don't yet have well-developed tools. 
So, um, so I think that's an exciting thing to be thinking about. And I think there are, you know, there are some people who are honest about it, intellectually honest about it, um, and, uh, and I hope we make some headway. So. All right, maybe we can take questions from the audience. So, well, you must feel a little bit like the monkey in the middle. <laughs> I, I want to ask a question that goes in just slightly a, a different direction from pure measurement, and that is among official donors, there is this perception that we're buying goodwill by uh, having the, the officially donor-administered programs we have in various countries. Right. But the way those programs are frequently administered creates the opposite effect. It creates a lot of bad will on sort of contractual accountabilities that are, are micromanaged. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I'm looking at, at uh, cash transfers, both conditional and unconditional, as a, and especially unconditional, as a really potent alternative. And I point to Pakistan, for example. USAID hates uh, doing work in Pakistan, and the, the feeling is ab absolutely mutual among Pakistanis. So uh, I, I, I have proposed a, uh, an unconditional cash transfer program as a way for the US, if it, if it really wants goodwill out of its uh, donor program, this would be a much more effective vehicle uh, uh, through which to do that, and I'd like your reaction. Oh, that's great. Uh, Pakistan is an interesting place. They have, you know, one of the uh, one of the bigger uh, uh, cash transfer programs of their own, the Benazir Income Support Program. So, um, can I use that as an opportunity to kind of talk about the political economy of these things more generally? Because I think that's kind of what we're talking about: is like who likes them and who doesn't, right? Um, and then, especially in the context of an aid program. So, I think that you know the the people who get these programs um, tend to like them, not that surprisingly. And there's actually like good empirical evidence that they're like more likely to vote for the incumbent government and things like that. You know, in an aid context, you probably have a bit of the challenge of like when you give people stuff, it's easier to slap a from the American people logo on it. Um, but you know, maybe with digital money, we can send them a text message that says from the American people, right? So maybe we're probably like with technology ways of getting around that. So I think, you know, that part's good. Um, taxpayers tend to be skeptical. Um, and so as I mentioned earlier, the way these often get packaged is there's some way in which it's made more palatable to people by saying, well, it's not just a handout. We're going to make people jump through a hoop. Or you know, in India, for example, there's a, a massive workfare scheme um, where people have to dig some holes in the ground or help to build a road or something, and then they get paid. And you know, when you talk to the people who designed this thing, they said, you know, we'd have been quite interested in unconditional transfers, but there's no way that would have gotten through. Right? Um, and then I think the third key stakeholder are the people implementing the programs. Um, and this is where I think kind of your point is so salient. Um, which is that cash transfers are sort of unusually bad in terms of the opportunities they generate for, uh, for implementing you know, vendors, contractors, things like that. Right? There's just not as much work to be done. You know, maybe there's a contract for a bank or an MPESA or somebody like that, but it's not like you know, if we're going to go out and procure a bunch of food. You look at food aid, right? I mean, the kind of the, it's, a, it's an enormous benefit for, uh, for American agribusiness firms and for shipping firms. Right? Um, and so uh, those are very powerful constituencies, and that's the reason why we continue to ship food around the world, even though we all know it doesn't make sense. Um, and so I think those tend to be where you know, it's hardest to find allies for cash transfers and easiest to find enemies. Get the microphone. So uh, you touched on the fact that cash transfers by default incorporate recipient preferences by giving someone the ability to buy a health product or something else yep. um, if they wish. And I'm wondering to what extent you incorporate recipient preferences into mm -hmm. the features of cash transfer program, such as how it's dispersed um, and the outcomes that you measure. And if you think it's important, how do you do it? Yeah, um, that's a great one. So um, the, the um, designs that we've started with at first, I'd say, when I say cash transfers, we're kind of you know, sweeping with a broad brush over a whole different array of different things you could do, right? Different designs, as you said. So just to be very concrete about that, I could give somebody a whole bunch of money once and walk away. I could give people you know, a little bit of money for the rest of their life, which is more like the basic income design that we're now testing. Um, you know, different amounts. I could give half the people in the village a big amount or everybody in the village a smaller amount, right? So there are all these different things you could do differently. And, and to your point, yeah, I think that when what feedback we get from people about what actually works best for them and what they would like should be a big component of that. Um, you know, at GiveDirectly, we kind of have to balance that a little bit with what we can actually raise money for, right? What are donors willing? So if there's a design that people think is crazy, you know, the fact that we gave people lump sums when we started, I think, was really helpful to a lot of people because a lot of people had this dependency concern that, oh, their people are going to become dependent on it. And that's not what we actually see in the data, but it's very easy to say, well, we just give people money once. They said, oh, okay, well, there's nothing, 
You know what I mean? So that's kind of how we think about it, is that we have to be kind of, if we're going to optimize for total impact, you know, for a fixed budget, we'd want to do it the way recipients tell us works best for them. But we also need to think about the size of that envelope. So one very specific example, we ran a, a project where we asked people, how would you like to structure your transfer? Like, how many installments would you like? And what's interesting about this is that, you know, I mentioned earlier that there are all these people getting cash transfers from their government. Those are typically like monthly or bi-monthly payments. And they're designed to try to keep people from starving. Right? It's kind of meet basic minimum needs. Right? That's very explicitly the intention. When we ran this experiment and asked people, if you're going to get X dollars, do you want it all at once or do you want it in a series of small payments? Overwhelmingly, at least in that sample, people wanted to get one or two big payments. And you know, they had some really interesting things to say about why. Right? Things like, you know, I have this big thing that I want to do, and if I get the small payments, I'm going to have a hard time saving them up. You know, I'm going to get pressured to give the money to somebody else, or I'm going to get tempted to waste it. So you know, people are kind of, I think, at some level, fairly aware of their own psychological limitations and the pressures they face from peers. So you know, there's a very clear answer there that I think for a lot of people, there was an, something they wanted to be able to do. And one structure is going to work better for them than another. So I think there are like, potentially big opportunities there. Because we're moving hundreds of billions of dollars a year to people in a way that's not at all responsive to those kinds of preferences. And, and maybe there is you know, 20% of value that we're leaving on the table. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? So it seems to me that there's a continuum between a unconditional cash transfer and leave aside the word universal and basic income. And I wonder if you could talk about that. I mean, an you can have unconditional cash transfers that take place for a year and then the program's over. Or you can have, nothing is forever, but most of the basic income programs, even if they're not universal, that is, even if it's not for all the citizenry, but only, say, for poor people, uh, have a much longer duration. Talk about the, your, what you know about the psychology and effects of the longer duration, and, to what, and <coughs> just talk about that in general. Yeah, I mean, very, very little, to be honest, so, which is why we, so we're running a, a basic income evaluation, which is really the first of its scale that's been run, um, and we launched that last year in Kenya, and that's in part because, you know, one of the big questions, I think, with basic income is if, if you know, we know a lot about the impacts of having a bit more money in your pocket right now, but what are the impacts of uh, incrementally knowing that a decade from now, your basic needs are going to be met? And so that's exactly what that experiment is designed to let us test, um, and, and I don't think we know. Um, on the topic of basic income, I think I just add that, you know, what's interesting about basic income as a form of cash transfer is there are, are these specific design differences and these kind of technocratic questions that we can ask about how are the impacts different and is this the best way to structure a transfer? I think those are interesting intellectually, and I'm working on them. But I also think that it, like what's really interesting about basic income is that it has shifted the debate about cash transfers from being one of these sort of fairly technocratic debates about the impacts towards questions that are sort of much deeper questions about how do we want to organize society and what's fair and things like that. Um, you know, whether it's you know, in India, kind of in a context with a lot of extreme poverty, Arvind Subramaniam, chief economic advisor, saying maybe this will be uh, to the 21st century what social and political rights were to the, to the 20th century, right? kind of thinking about, or you know, in, in South Africa, kind of people saying, we've always thought of cash transfers as something you give to, you know, to widows and to the disabled and to the elderly. But in a context with like 30% like youth male unemployment, is that still the right way to think about it? Maybe actually everybody should be eligible for that kind of support. So I think it's kind of shifting those kind of political frameworks that's most interesting. Um, you know, th th that's what's interesting about what UBI is doing. Can I jump in on this? Because uh, in France, the country where I come from, there is a minimum basic income that's been in place forever. Uh, it's called RMIRO, the minimum insertion. I guess it's been changed uh, since then. But it's... It, it doesn't, I mean, it, it's really a minimum income. It's, it's very low. So you can say it meets your basic needs, but it's like so basic that most people aspire to much more than that. And so we know from having, you know, just looking at the data that most people do not say, oh, great, there is this, you know, minimum, uh, you know, insurance thing I can get. And so let me just, uh, you know, do nothing. So it, it, it's almost like we, we could all... Um, thinks through the fact that in, in most countries where people have the opportunity to get, um, you know, to get more, that they take it uh, by by studying to get to get um, uh, more opportunities. And, and the fact that you can always, oh, not always, but like typically find a way to have just your very basic needs met doesn't seem to satisfy most people. So I would be willing to make the claim that 
even in poor countries, the exact same is true. And so the risk that uh, minimum basic income will just make people feel like, oh, okay, it's going to be forever, I don't have to do anything, is extremely low, just based on experience from, from, from rich countries. Um, yeah, and, you know, that's, that, that doesn't mean that you don't need to study yeah, it. That's, because, a, that, that's the experience yeah. from all of the studies of cash transfers we've yeah. done so far, and so I think that's uh, that's right. And you know, that was part of our debate, I guess. And you know, should we spend all the time and effort to start this big project when we already have so much evidence on cash transfers? But I, because I think it is reframing this debate in an interesting way, we felt like it would be valuable to have evidence on that specific design. And so, what's the timeline that you're going to be looking at? Yeah, so these transfers are so we're in we're in a, in a couple of different regions in Kenya. Transfers are going to run for a total of twelve years at least. That's what we have the money for and have committed to. And uh, we'll start. We'll go back to the field in early 2019, and then hopefully have some data to share with all of you uh, later on in 2019 on the impacts that's having. And so, what's going to be neat about that is, and I alluded to this because there's a, a group of people of villages where people are getting money for two years, and then a group where they're getting the money for the full twelve years. And so when we compare across those two, in both cases, we're seeing people who have received the same amount of money, but they have different expectations about what the future is going to be like. And that's what lets us kind of isolate that impact of like, you know, do you take more risk and try to migrate to the city or start a business? That's the, you know, the kind of optimist case. Or um, are you, um, you know, watching more TV and drinking more? That's kind of the, the pessimist case. Right. We'll take more questions from the every. Oh, sure, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, in terms of the external validity of the trials in Kenya, um, obviously that's money being brought in from a foreign country, so not coming from the Kenyan government. Do you see the Give Directly trials like being generalizable to a government program, or because that's foreign aid, like if the government were reapportioning from you know current programs to an unconditional cash transfer, would it be as effective? And have you guys thought about what would the governments of you know developing countries take from the trial? Yeah, um, I think let me actually split that into two questions. One is about um, what you know how will the impacts we see in Kenya be similar or different to the impacts you might see somewhere else? Um, and I, you know the short answer there is I would imagine they'd be quite different because the whole point in cash transfer is going to be the most you know, different impact, heterogeneous you know, kind of intervention you can imagine because it gives people the most flexibility. I think there will still be some broad lessons to be drawn about human behavior and psychology and things like that. Um, but it would be quite different from doing it here, for example. Um, but the second question is, you know, you can look at the impacts of receiving a basic income, which is what we're doing. Um, any country that wants to implement this is going to have to implement a basic income policy that includes both who gets it and where the money comes from. Right? And so the total impact of that policy would be the net impact of those two things. Right? Um, what's tricky about that is that there are lots of different ways you could finance you know, basic income for some people, some region, whatever. Um, different kinds of taxes. You could run larger deficits. You could ask USAID for more money. You kind of, so you know, it would be very difficult to do an evaluation, somehow to do an evaluation of all of those things. And it would really, you wouldn't really want to evaluate a specific proposal and kind of ask what we know about the impacts of that specific financing mechanism. All right, my, my dear colleague, John, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to say that you were talking about the need for research. But there is a lot of research. Back in the 1960s, when within America, poverty was a, uh, a major political issue, the federal government was convinced to run experiments. They were called the negative income tax experiments. Right. The, the largest and administrative, administratively the best run were conducted in Denver and Seattle, known as the SIME diet, the San Seattle income matrix experiment, the Denver income matrix experiment. Low income families were divided into control and experimental households. They were, they were given what is now called currently a basic income. And as their incomes rose beyond not working at all, some was taxed away. And different families, different households, were subject to different basic incomes and different implicit tax rates. 
thousands of households. Some had this program for three years, some five years, and some were told they were going to receive them for 20 years. They've been extensively analyzed, and one, perhaps the only, but one robust result is that when people are given unconditional income, they are less likely to work for pay. They, if they are working, they will reduce their hours, sometimes reduce their hours such they're not working at all. And there was, a, there was an element of um, evasion and it, and, uh, of, of, the, um, of the taxes. Um, this was inferred, th this was the source, in fact, of what nowadays is called difference in difference analysis. Experimental families were compared with control families. Experimental families were compared before the experiment to their behavior on the experiment. And as I say, a robust result was that it had negative work implications, which meant what? That it was very costly. When, in other words, assuming the cost of these transfers is such that it doesn't reduce the number of people working, would be an underestimate of the true cost of the experiment, since, the, since there was a, a lower income base from which to tax income. Do you have the point estimates? Sorry? Do you know the point estimates from the top no, of your head? The magnitude of the effects that you're describing? I don't understand what you're saying. The point oh, estimates. How oh, big, like, yes. oh, there's, a, there's a raft of results. I kind of give you a single No, because it, it, you, you, you can imagine a situation where, um, you know, yes, of, you know, some people will just take the opportunity to, you know, quit a job that was really, like, you know, Painful or annoying, or they had a nasty boss. Uh, but that may be like you know three or four percentage points of the population, and that that can show up as being a significant effect. It right doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that for the great majority of the people who receive this transfer, it, it's it's not a, a massive improvement in terms of their quality of life and the schooling of their children. We can you know then later on do better. So I'm just saying it's like you know it would be great to and I'm not familiar with this result, so I, I, I'm I'm taking notes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the same dime. <laughs> I'll study that. It was just one experiment. There were four. All right. The, the one I know was the Seattle Inca and Central experiment. And it meant how many people actually quit. It depends upon how much they were given. In other words, they tested different types of programs. They are, they are, they are, they are right. rational economists. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm well aware of the negative income tax experiment, so thank you for bringing it up. Could I respond to that? SRI. Yes. Shall I respond? I'm sorry? Shall I react to that? Thank you for bringing oh, it up. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah the, I think the, um, the, so absolutely, the negative income tax experience is an important part of U.S. kind of policy history. Um, and indeed, as you may know, Richard Dixon, of all people, had sort of really seriously considered the idea of UBI as a policy that he would put on the table. And I think the negative um, income tax experiments were, uh, were part of what killed that off. So. Um, that's right. I think that, you know, kind of U.S. labor economists' read of those results has been that the labor supply impacts were, you know, if anything, sort of smaller than they would have expected. But they were certainly big enough in terms of the political discourse to absolutely uh, nix, if I may, um, um, interest in the policy at that point in time, right? So what, you know, what UBI advocates today would say is they would say, well, you know, the kind of implicit tax in, you know, in the design of the negative income tax experiments kicks in quite low, right? So for the people participating in these programs, the disincentives to work are quite strong once you start getting to the phase out. Um, and that they want to design where those implicit taxes are much higher up in the income distribution, right? Like a larger share of people are getting it, the phase outs are more gradual, things like that. Um, you know, I don't know if we'll get to run an experiment like that in the US, because you only get to run so many experiments. Um, and uh, um, you know, right now, the ones that are being run are being financed with you know, private philanthropy, um, as you probably know. So um, I don't know if we'll get to test that. Um, the other thing I'd say is that um, you know the kind of experiments that we've run in emerging markets have pretty systematically not reached this conclusion. Sort of, uh, they've actually, if anything, found positive labor supply impacts. 
And there's some interesting nuance around that. Effects are different for different subpopulations, as you could imagine. Um, I do think one of the things that's probably importantly different between uh, rich countries and poor countries is that in poor countries, you have more people who are uh, working less than they would like to simply because they don't have access to the capital they need to do that. Um, and so one of the things you see in a lot of the cash transfer evaluations in developing countries is you know, people who were trained as a welder buying welding equipment or something like that, um, as, which then leads to them doing a, a bit more skilled or semi-skilled work or things like that. Um, but I mean, you should expect it, right? I would, I would absolutely expect that if we give people a minimum basic income, some people are going to work less, some people are going to spend more time with their kids, more time with their schooling. There will be some people that are going to play more video games. I, I think that should be a, and I don't think, I think any serious economist would predict that. I just want to add that I think this highlights Avery's point about generalizability. Uh, cultural differences from region to region, let alone country to country, uh, and economic differences may predict very different different outcomes. <laughs> yes. All this policy, I want to hear Mr. Bress talk about philanthropy, if I may ask you, sir. Um, Paul's got his own perspective as a leader of Give Directly, but I'm curious, given your role at the Hewlett Foundation and in general, what your view is about the evolution of the organized funding community thinking about cash transfers as worthy of philanthropic investment. You know, I have not... Um, there's an old saying, which is a little bit exaggerated, which is, if you know one foundation, you know one foundation. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I haven't surveyed uh, you know, the way foundations think about this. But I'll tell you the way, I, if I were still running a foundation and we were doing grant making in this area, uh, in global development, which the foundation, Hewlett Foundation continues to do, I would think of it in terms of what outcomes are we trying to achieve? It actually goes back to the first question I asked Paul. Uh, are we interested in reducing poverty? Are we interested in creating greater autonomy or both of those? And then I would look and see what programs uh, are most likely to achieve those goals. I think the promise of, of Give Directly and other unconditional cash transfer programs, we've just begun. I mean, this is, you know, Paul is an, early social entrepreneur in this issue, and this, this, is, this is early days still. Uh, I think it's well worth, what, let's, let's just suppose that the goal is poverty alleviation, to make, it, to make it simple. I think there is huge potential for this happening, and you know, if I were a foundation, I would, I would especially put my money on very well thought out uh, interventions with experiments attached to them. In, in, so that we could, we could learn much more. In that respect, I don't think philanthropy, you know, philanthropists have the, the luxury of being able to put money into something like this without there being political accountability. And that makes it all the more valuable to put the money into to really smart experiments. So if there's a foundation leader out here, you know, think about Paul. <laughs> Yes. Thanks. Um, I'm curious because, you know, give it directly and these kinds of ideas are still relatively new ideas. And I think over the history of kind of aid and philanthropy, we've definitely seen things rise and then people identify downfalls with them or something new comes in and takes their place. And I'm just curious, like if you projected 20 or 40 years in the future, what do you think are some of the things that we might look back and say, gosh, we wish we'd done that differently or known of that kind of side effect of cash transfers? I mean, if, we, if you could do that, we would, we would already be working on them, I guess. So it's a pretty <laughs> tough question to answer. But um, I think there is, you know, look, I think one element of your comment, which is exactly right, is that the whole sort of field is very subject to fads. Um, and as much as possible, you want to lean into that, be your own worst critic, and kind of try to anticipate um, what those things might be and, and get ahead of them. Um, and I guess the other part of it is, you know, and, and it's funny because I talked to, I was talking, for example, to Santiago Levy, who is the architect of Progresa, this program in Mexico that Pascaline mentioned, and he said, you know, boy, like, we did everything we could, right? Um, we tried so hard, and, and yet inevitably it got hyped up, and inevitably there was some backlash when it didn't achieve everything that, you know, everybody had 
all the wishes that people had projected onto it, right? So I don't know. It, my sense is that, that to some extent that's unavoidable, but you do all that you can. Um, you know, a very recent example of this, we, we are running this fascinating partnership with USAID. Um, and I'll actually use this to illustrate two points. So um, it's, a, it's a partnership where we're running these benchmarking evaluations where we compare the impact of what they traditionally do to the impact of cash transfers. And so this is a very risky thing for an organization like USAID to do. And indeed, we've had to keep it under wraps for a very long time. We've had to, I mean, these crazy structures where like we have to call all the people that get the money and ask if they spent any of it on like alcohol or tobacco or birth control. And then anyone who says yes to that, Google pays for it. So that's like the financing structure so that they can go to the Hill and say that taxpayer money wasn't, you know, all this stuff, right? Because it's their risk averse organization. And so, but we finally kind of came out with the first set of results from this. Um, and so in this case, the, the legacy intervention that they wanted to evaluate and compare to cash transfers um, didn't really move any of the, the primary outcomes that they were trying to. And so that's kind of a scary moment for them. Um, and you know, we, were, we had three months to prepare for this and the whole goal was avoid the kind of cash wins narrative um, and make the story good for USAID for doing science, right? It's like A-B testing comes to DC, right? That was the goal. Um, and we got a little bit of that, but we also, there are probably two or three cash wins headlines as well, right? So it's just very hard to fight that because of all the incentives to sensationalize and dramatize. Um, but the second lesson is I think part of what we're trying to do there is to kind of institutionalize this so that it does have staying power and becomes kind of part of the process and not just a hot topic for conversation at, at conferences and workshops. So um, the, the economist, the mission economist in Rwanda who first got this going now has a job in DC, which is to coordinate this effort globally. Right? And there's language in a lot of sort of RFPs saying that um, you know, it's sort of good practice to compare to these things and think about this. And so I think it's those small changes, like the creation of new career trajectories inside the bureaucracy, or the change in the language that people use to evaluate decisions. Um, those are the sort of things you want to be thinking about. How can you give it uh, momentum? Can, can I raise one completely different question? Are we ready to adjourn almost? Or? I think we're supposed to um, end now. So I have been, <laughs> oh, wait, but, but we, 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 you have the last word, Brett. So we've been, the whole conversation has appropriately focused on interventions aimed at individuals or families with, with spillover for communities maybe. But there's, there's a whole other category of interventions to try to deal with poverty, which involves systems change and policy change. Uh, the, for better or worse, the World Bank has put lots of money into, I, I'm looking at Eric here, who knows the worst part, lots of money into reforming justice systems, uh, the administration of justice, most of which does not seem to have had any, any effect. Uh, but you know, reducing, reducing corruption uh, of governments in developing countries, maybe other countries too, could have huge effects. And those are just different interventions, right? They, they, these, are, these call for advocacy. They call for policy change. Uh, they are much riskier than you, they're, they're, they're much harder to replicate. But it's just worth noting there's this other important category. In, in their book, Poor Economics, uh, Abhijit Abid Banerjee and Esther Duflo argue strongly in favor of the kind of interventions we've been talking about, whether it's direct uh, health or education interventions or conditional or unconditional cash transfers. But there is this large domain where I, I don't think we should give up on the possibility of, of systems change having an effect on poverty. All right, well, well said, thank you. Thank you both uh, for participating. Thank you everyone for your questions and for joining us.